Welcome to the UP Notable Books Club, brought to you by the Upper Peninsula Publisher and Authors Association. Hilton Everett Moore is a published short story author who lives and writes at his remote cabin in the near wilderness of Barriga County in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. He has held many positions in his life, including a stint as a kennel man for a humane society, a factory worker, later as a certified pipe welder in the oil fields of West Texas, and also as an assistant manager of a lumber company. Ironically, in a chapter he would like to forget, a gut-wrenching failed attempt at owning a restaurant. After a midlife crisis, he went back to college and received a master's degree in social work. Upon graduation, he was employed in the Michigan prison system as a clinical social worker. Presently, he enjoys writing in his cabin in the wilderness. My name is Evelyn Gothu, and I'm the uh, director of the Crystal Falls District Community Library. And there's one thing I have to tell you guys is today, I was telling Hilton, is our sign up for the summer reading program. I got my shirt on here. So in <laughs> case person comes in, and so all the kids are supposed to come in today and pick up their book bag and talk a little bit about the program. I've seen most of the kids, but of course there could be a few. So if you see my screen go black and my, and I mute myself, it's, I'm, um, I'm just having to talk to somebody about summer reading, but I'll jump back on as soon as I can. And let's see. So, um, usually Victor at this point gives some Yupa announcements. Do, does anyone who's in Yupa want to say anything that we need to know? No, I'm just happy to see everybody can... and hope you hope everybody attends the conference. I think it's going yeah. to be great. I think so. Yeah, too. and from being on the from being on the board point of view, I'd just say everybody's welcome, even if you sign up at the last minute, we can work you in. That's great. Okay. And they can do that by just Googling UPA, U P P A, yeah. and and getting in that way, Deborah. Uh, probably, or yeah, or just show up at the Peter White Library Marquette at, what time does it start? I mean, I know what time I have to be there to set up, but I think the actual, the actual thing starts at 10. <laughs> I think it starts at 9.30 this year, Deborah. Okay, at any rate, I know maybe I'm going to be there. Yeah, 9.30 <laughs> is registration. Perfect. Get yeah. your name tag. Well, Wonderful. And I'm, I know we have a short group today, which sometimes we do, especially in the summer. But like, like I said, these get recorded and a lot of people watch the recordings afterwards. So I, without any further ado, I would like to introduce you all to Mr. Hilton Moore, the author of North of Nelson. And I don't know about you guys, but I, I, and did you all get a chance to read it yet? I know Terry was saying she read some. Oh, Tina's got it there. Um, the you others. I do. <laughs> okay, I I I, loved, yeah, I read it all. I loved it. Mm -hmm. I really did. So take it away, Hilton. It was a great book. What can you tell us? How, what what's what's the um what's the behind the music here? What can you fill us in on? <laughs> okay, first thing I I just want to bring up is <laughs> that is the book, and it's um cover. Cover was done by a professional graphic artist in Bucharest, Romania. Anyway, I've used I've used her on my second volume, which is coming up. Um, do you want me to just start? Okay. Um, I don't really have a background in writing, other than I was a writing tutor in college at a later stage of my life. And um, that's kind of how I got into the writing field. I found out I loved it. In fact, I found out I have passion for it. And um, I've kind of followed that passion. Um, it's been instructional in my own personal life. And in that um, when, you, when you're writing, truths come out, whether you tended them to or not. Um, and I think it's important to follow that intuition that you get. My writing, um, I'm told, is a little different because I start with the ending and work towards the beginning. I come up with the idea of how something can 
should conclude. And then I write forward from that. So <clears throat> reading north of Nelson, you'll find in volume one that there's six short stories and they're sequential in time. Uh, it starts around 1880 roughly and goes to 1970. Volume two, which is in the press right now, is it Tina or soon? Um, we'll go from 1950 or thereabouts to the present or near the present. Um, I, Terry, Terry did such a nice job with a PowerPoint presentation. Um, and I, I'm not uh, very talented that way. In fact, computers and I have a, kind of a love-hate relationship. Um, but uh, I'll give you some thoughts of, of what I think about writing, and then you can take them and uh, digest them and either take them in or throw them out because they're not applicable to you. But um, I came up with a short outline. I promise not to bore you to death, but I wanted to express how I feel and I'm open to discussion and disagreement or, or anything else, but I think if you can imagine your life as a complicated Venn diagram, I don't know if you remember those from um, first year algebra where the different circles intersect and sometimes there can be two circles or three circles intersecting and somewhere there is a common ground in those in a Venn diagram. And it's in, um, but I, I see myself as a writer that my Venn diagram um, is the intersection of religion, culture, science, which of course includes in education. And, um, it's a complicated Venn diagram for everybody, but you're going to be putting that Venn diagram on a character in your work, in your book. And then you're going to express the common ground in that Venn diagram in your character. Now, I, I got to tell you, I'm, I'm not terribly Christian oriented and um, so some of my work reflects that. It is not that I'm trying to offend anybody, but I'm trying to bring up some questions and let people come to their own conclusions. One of the most impressive books I ever read in my life was a very short, thin novel by a man called Herman Hesse, and the book was called Siddhartha. I don't know how many of you are familiar with it, but it was a life-changing book for me. Um, I, I guess at this point in my life, I, I see myself as a sentient individual and everything around me is sentient. What I mean is, I think life occurs in everything, including things that we think it couldn't exist in, like a rock. But if you remember your chemistry classes, you'll remember protons and neutrons and electrons and how the electrons whirled around the protein, the protons and the neutrons. Well, even something that's stationary, like a rock, which Siddhartha sat beside, has something going inside it. I mean, the electrons are moving. So even in stationary, rigid, things, things that we think are impossible to, to have a life, I believe they have a life. I believe that there, there is that everything is sentient. And it's a matter of me as a writer to get that across to the reader. 
Now, I don't expect agreement from anybody, but I'm also unapologetic about how I think. And, uh, you know, I tend to be way left of center. That's just my political leanings. But um, I'm trying to express in my writing my sense of how life is. So I am, uh, I am trying to incorporate both Eastern religion and the Native American religion in my writing. And sometimes that comes out well and sometimes not so well. But um, I believe that everything is sentient, including rocks and trees and the lake, which is outside my cabin door. All of that is sentient. All of it has something to say to me that I, in turn, try to explain to others, not for them to accept my beliefs, but for them to at least challenge their own beliefs. I believe my writing is like spontaneous combustion. I don't know if you're familiar with the way a grain elevator works. These big silos that go up in the air, but they have to have they have to have air going through them that's channeled through these silos or the corn or the sorghum or whatever's in the silo. If it reaches a critical temperature, can actually explode in fire. And um, that's how I view my writing. I'm not, not sure exactly how it works, but I think that at some point, in bubbling in my head is this, this near combustible surface that when it reaches a certain point in my head, it blows up into an idea. And as I said before, I work backwards to most, I'm, I'm sure to most writers. My, when, when the thing combusts for me, it it uh, it leaves me with a conclusion. And that conclusion is the conclusion of my novel. Once I get the conclusion set, then for some reason, which falls outside of my understanding, the ideas come about that justify the conclusion that I've already decided. So <clears throat> a, a friend not too long ago said that my work is kind of like Michener. Well, I, you know, that's a compliment I don't think I deserve, but um, I work from a place. The place happens to be Nelson. Now, Nelson doesn't really exist except in my mind. But in each short story, there is a conclusion that I came to, which precipitated the writing of that particular short story. To me, there are, as a writer, just this is my own feeling. There are no taboo subjects, absolutely none. If it exists in human form or, or within the human psyche or within our culture, you know, go, you can go on and on about that. It's fair game for a writer. In fact, it's necessary. We can't let libraries and thinking people be confined by government or culture. There is nothing that a writer should, should left, leave unwritten. 
it is up to writers to prove to the world that there's other ways of thinking. And I believe that the most dangerous creature on the planet is a writer with a pen. It is up to us to say what needs to be said, even if it's uncomfortable within you. It's, I, I, I challenge you to bring forth those things that, that are hidden, that are not seen. I challenge writers to say and do what they're uncomfortable with. Now we live in a basically Protestant culture. That's a byproduct of our Puritan heritage. Now that's changing rapidly and it will continue to change. And many people who have staunch ideas about the way things are, are going to be challenged. Not <clears throat> because I say so, but I think demographically things are changing. And as writers, most of us in, in this neck of the word, world come from uh, Protestant um, culture. And we're going to be challenged. <clears throat> I, I'm, I'm a minister's son. So I, you know, I know a little bit of what I'm speaking about. We, we have a sense that there was a man called Jesus and it's sacrilegious to write anything that would contradict that. Oh, but <clears throat> maybe I can challenge you if you've never read Kazantzaki's The Last Temptation of Christ. Um, there, there is more to everything than we can put our hand on. And I'm not here to tell you what to believe, but just to challenge you to think about what you believe and to write about things that you believe, but always being open to the larger question. And the question is, what's in front of me? Is this really the way things are? Or am I just mimicking what's already been? Don't assume the truth that you were born with and raised in is the only world view without considering other worldviews and other religions and other cultures. I believe that all humans are gods. I know that's kind of a far out thing to believe, but that's what I believe. And I believe our destiny is to become what we are. And nobody can do that but ourselves. And I um, also believe that writers who become offended easily should probably find another vocation. And I mean that. If, you know, there's the old too many cooks in the kitchen or whatever you want to say. Um, if, if you're not willing to challenge yourself and your readers, you're doing a disservice to both of you. I believe a writer is a little bit like a flashlight beam in the dark, which gives us only a limited view of the planet and of our thinking and of our culture and of our religion. It's a beam of light that goes out within all the blackness, but it's up to us as writers 
to say there's there is something out there in the dark that we need to capture on paper and express. <laughs> this is just a laugh line because I've been a little serious, I guess. But um, I heard recently this wonderful comment and I wanna pass it on. And that is don't argue with a person whose television set is larger than their library. It's interesting to me to note that in our culture and then in the United States, and maybe at this specific time and place, that many people have only one book in their household, and that's the Bible. But even then, how many of them have ever read it cover to cover? So unfortunately, our culture is being pushed and pulled, and it's very divisive now, <laughs> and probably for good reason. But I think it's time for writers to say to many people that there are books that need to be read outside of the Bible, that our culture must move past this single book attitude that the Bible is the only book on the planet. And it may or may not happen in my life. I don't know. We'll see. So that's my end of my outline. So um, if you want to bring up questions about the book, that's it, North of Nelson. I think it came out pretty good for first effort. Um, it is illustrated. Um, I kind of wanted to throw the book back in time a little bit. Um, because I think that there was a time when writers, besides the Big Ten or whatever the number is, when writers were appreciated for a complete book, the one that had illustrations too. So um, I purposely had illustrations put in, not, not to um, necessarily enhance the book, but to provide a more entertaining feature. Each short story has a conclusion, but sometimes the conclusions aren't necessarily pat answers or pretty endings, because in my life, personal life, I, I, I've had a lot of dead end streets and um, I don't mind it admitting that um, I've made my share of mistakes. And um, I, I think it's up to a writer to challenge their own belief systems every day. So I'm, I'm open to questions at this point or comments or whatever, and I'll try to answer them as honestly as I can. Okay. Hey, I'll say I have a question, but somebody else might have spoken first. No, you go ahead, Terry. Okay. Um, it's always hard with Zoom to try to, you were talking about you, Hilton, that you kind of start, you start with the conclusion and have you ever, and, and it sounds like this, then you write the story and that, that fits the conclusion. Maybe I'm simplifying it. But have you ever had this conclusion and worked on the story and it really hasn't ended at that conclusion that you had to redo it or go back and rewrite to, to reach that conclusion because that's your message that you're trying to get across? I've had to change minor details. Like if you look at North of Nelson, 
you'll find a timeline in the front. Mm -hmm. um, this is a timeline. Now, to make it fit the timeline, I, I had to make adjustments. And Tina, who is my administrative assistant, I can see she's there smiling. Um, <laughs> I've had to make changes uh, as I've go gone along, but generally when I talk about the combustible experience that it is for me, uh, it's, it's not that I don't rework things, but generally I spend a lot of time thinking about the conclusion. And then I write the story that fulfills the conclusion. Yes, I've had to change things as I go along, but basically once this combustible process has happened in my brain, I know what the end is. And it's a way of working towards the end. It's I interesting. I, I mean, I've, I've written things where I have no idea where it's going. And I've, I've told people that in workshops and different things, because everybody, every writer has their own style. Some have outlines, you know, this and that, that so I believe like a story sometimes comes to life. It's like a Ouija board and it just takes over. And I realize it's really coming for me, for my soul or whatever, but um, I try not to be over controlling with that. But then I sometimes do have trouble wrapping it up because you're just sort of going off. Um, so it's just interesting. I've never heard anybody really say they've started with this, I want to say aha moment, you call it combustible moment um, of a conclusion. This is where I'm going to, you know, take the story. It's it's very interesting. And that, that to me would be a great writing exercise, actually, for people learning to write. And um, just because because to me that's not if most people start at the beginning and they may they may know okay at the end I'm going to have these two people get married and he's going to become a doctor and this is what's going to happen but I have to get there in an interesting fashion but you, it sounds like your conclusion is more um, it, much deeper than just wrapping up the story and the loose ends and stuff like that. Oh yeah, it takes me some oh, well Tina knows it it takes me sometimes weeks to come up with the ending before i begin the writing so in my head i i guess you could call that an outline of of, of sorts but it's emotionally driven mm -hmm. so i if i know the character is going to have is going to die on the operating table. <laughs> we'll use that one. <laughs> if I know that the 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 um, protagonist is going to die on the operating table, um, yeah. Rem, quiet. Uh, I not just know that he's going to die on the operating table. I'm going to have in my head everything that's spinning around that character at that time. They're, what What's happening in their psyche, what's happening in the operating room. Um, when I wrote North of Nelson, there's six short stories. Each one represents six combustible moments. When, when I found the ending and it's it doesn't happen overnight this is not something that i i wake up in the morning and say ah it it's um sometimes it's a complicated process well writing is a complicated process um and i'll let somebody else talk but <laughs> you've piqued my curiosity how about a full length novel rather than short stories and, I'm just and, I'm just finishing one. Oh, it's, are you? Oh, of course you are. <laughs> it's it's called it's called uh, Rabbit Girl, and it's about it takes place in the Upper Peninsula, and it's about uh, a young Native American who loses her mother to cancer, and is left uh, destitute on her homestead. 
takes place basically in the 50s. Mm. Um, and um, there's there's some scenes in there that are um, raw. And um, but to me, like I said, I, I don't pull any punches. If I if I think something should be written a certain way, that's the way it's going to happen. Yeah. And if I offend people, I'm I'm unapologetic about it. Well, good for you. And I I agree. Somebody else. <laughs> Mary Francis. Hi. <laughs> when you were talking about writing writing what you're uh, you you were afraid to say or you're not sure you should say. I, that sounds a lot like my next book. <laughs> it's coming out next fall. You know, it, it deals with some things that, you know, I it took me a long time to decide that I was going to write that, you know, about family issues that I won't explain right now. But <laughs> anyway, it's, uh, yeah, it's coming. It's uh, I was surprised because my publisher is releasing it October 1st. That's about three months earlier than I thought she was going to. So I'm excited about that. That's yeah. Good. yeah, it's called Far From Magnolia Drive because that was the name of the street I grew up on. And uh, is it a memoir? It, it well, it started out as a memoir, and um I couldn't get enough people interested in it as a memoir. So I decided to uh fictionalize it and give it a little bit more spice <laughs> and zest. And because I had certain characters that I wanted to conflate or take two or three different people and put them all together in one person um, so that it was not as many, not too many characters floating in and out. So that was part of it, too. Plus, you know, to protect the innocent and the guilty. <laughs> yeah, sometimes we have to protect the guilty. Yeah. We don't yeah. want to, but it. <laughs> Yeah, for, for a lot of reasons we do. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it was something that I had I had to make sure my kids read it, <clears throat> and it took them about four years to get around to it. I had to give them a deadline. I said, "You got to read it by this date, or else it's going to the publisher anyway." They finally read it <laughs> and said, "Okay." <laughs> You know, I keep thinking. You know, as I'm listening to you talk, like we've had other. Um, of course, authors on Zooms. And then even here at the library, we've invited a lot of authors to come and speak. And, you know, I've always heard that phrase, like if you're a writer, you're either a pantser or a planner. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. you 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 um, you do it by the seat of your pants or you plan. Yeah. And you, with these endings first, you know, we need a new P word. I'm thinking like you're a pulverizer or something. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there that you go. Means that combustibleness yeah. Yeah. that you come up with first, you know. Yeah, I'm a pantser because sometimes I'll be writing along and I think I know what this character is going to do and they turn off and go in a whole different direction. Yeah. I don't know what you call that. I felt, you know, when I read your book, Hilton, I, I just, I don't know. I mean, I read a lot of books, obviously. You know, I've taught English for 24 years and then I've been here, the director of the library for four. And I, you know, you... Again, as a librarian, you know, you spend so much of your time reading the backs of these books and all the reviews. And, you know, they're always nice. You know, every book is a great book. <laughs> it's hard sometimes to, what do you buy? Because no one has on the back of the book, just mediocre. I mean, every book is the best <laughs> book ever, you know. But, you know, when I read, somebody wrote that your book was like the Dubliners. And I thought to myself, whoa you know that that those are some tough shoes to fill James Joyce you know I, I love James Joyce I've taught the Dubliners many times I've read Ulysses I I haven't you know I've read you know all these and I'm thinking ah I no he, he can't do it <laughs> and then I'll be damned I read it and you are like James Joyce I I mean really you have that same knack of those short stories that you know, you're you're reading them, and maybe it's like what you say, like this combustibleness, because you know, you're reading the story and, and it's going this way, 
and it has a twist, but it's not like this. I mean, it's just, it's just enough. It's like, that's, that's, oh, Hilton, it's like magic. You know, I, <laughs> not many people have that, you know, it's like going to the hairdresser and getting your hair right. It's like, you do it. You, I don't know how you do it. I was wowed. I thought those six stories were, I want more. <laughs> there, more, is more. more. there is more. There is more. What team. can we expect in the new North of Nelson? What's it called? North of Nelson, volume two. Okay, original. And <laughs> It'll have a cover that's similar. Uh-huh. But I can not... show you a picture of the cover. Yeah, yeah. Show us the picture. You want me to show him, Hilton? Yeah, go ahead. But well, do we are are some of the characters coming back? Is it the same the, family? The Martin family continues. Okay. Good. So all right. This is just a rough version, but this is basically what it's gonna look like. I don't know if you guys can see it. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you see it? Yeah. Can you raise it up just a little bit, Tina? So, yeah. Yeah, that's nice. And then, yeah, oh yeah, there's that at the bottom. I'm sorry, my fingers mm -hmm. covering it. That's good. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's it's when you put the two together, see how they kind of enhance each other. Yes. With the covers. Really nice. That's, That's be what we were thinking. <laughs> there, what do you think? There you go. Sorry, Hilton, to interject. No, I'm no, sorry. No, not a problem, Tina. I just want to spread the word. <laughs> Tina's, Tina, Tina's takes up all the slack in, in my process. I try. The um, North of Nelson, Volume 2, is a continuation of North of Nelson, Volume 1. The Martin family, which is uh, essentially a minister in every short story uh, or, or something similar. Um, in one story, he's, a, um, he's the uh, social services director who's retired. But they all have someone who has a religious belief system in each one of these short stories. And I don't go about telling people how to interpret that. It's up to them. I just set it out there. And, and um, my hope is not to provide an answer, but to provide a question. Something that uh, people, can sit with a glass of wine after, even after they've read the story and have something to think about. So any other questions? Thank you. And thanks I'll for- I'll ask, another, I'll ask another one. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> um, are any of these sort of based, I mean, a lot of times our characters we extract things from people we know. I'm just starting the one with the boy with polio and I didn't get through it yet. So I don't know how it concludes, um, but I'm just wondering, it, you know, you've got some historically accurate material there. And if it's based on anybody you know or read about, my mother happened to work in a polio ward as a nurse and, you know, have you tapped into to things to, you know, show this isolation and loneliness and mm -hmm. that kind of thing, or just in in volume two, which is almost on the press, is a story about a young man with polio. Or is that in here? Is that volume one? Or volume, volume one. Or? Volume one is Ernie. it's um, oh yeah, it's Ernie. Requiem for Ernie. Yeah, Requiem for Ernie. When I was a kid, um, because my my dad was a uh, minister, we were shifted around about every two years. We got two years, we were lucky. But <clears throat> so I met a wide range of people in my life growing up with different ways of thinking, different religions, different cultures. And uh, down the street, 
when I lived in Battle Creek was a young man who had polio and he couldn't play baseball. But well, if you've read this story, Requiem for Ernie, you'll find that there's a young man in here who has polio and is unable to play baseball. So that part is lifted um, from real life. Most of my short stories, most of them have some, I would say almost like congruent features with uh, real life. I mean, I, I pick and choose, but then it, it sits in my silo that I talked about for a while until I decide how to use it. Um, in, in the case of the Martin family, because I came from a religious background, you know, I can't help but um, say that it, maybe this is, I don't mean to, to um, insult anybody, but um, religion infects most of my stories. And um, I, I try to challenge people to look beyond necessarily uh, where they were brought up or what culture they were brought up in or what religion or what color skin they have or what sexual orientation. I try to challenge those things because I think they need to be challenged. Shelly, did you have a question? I noticed you were. It wasn't a question. It was more a comment. Um, and it goes back to something you said early in, in your statement. Um, I have to say, when I first started the book, I don't know if I'd say offense, but right away I thought, oh, I don't know, do I really want to read this? Um, and then I very quickly got into the care. I had to like remind myself that that was the 1890s or 18 something. And it was like, you know, yeah, they might've really talked that way. They might've really said those kinds of things. And so I was more impressed with the character development um, along and, you know, through the stories, like how, how different characters got developed and how they were just very real. And, and it, unlike how a lot of books are maybe cleaned up or neatened up. Um, so I was impressed. I, I really enjoyed this. Um, my favorite is The Silent Mistress, which had me in tears. Um, so I don't know if everyone already read that, but, but it's like, oh my gosh, I just... And then you made a comment about the, the end. And see, I guess I think, I don't think any of those stories really end. Um, I felt at the end of every story that there was something still going on. I just don't know what it is. Um, so, you know, the, the story with the silent mistress, she doesn't die. Um, something more happens to her. We just don't, I just don't know. Um, I don't, you know, so now I can imagine that myself that she might be more accepted in her community or, or maybe she stays um, alone. Uh, you know, I don't know. I can do what I want with that. Um, and I felt the same way about the um, Requiem for Ernie. Um, I loved that story. I loved that it brought in the tigers and Ernie Harwell. <laughs> um, so, you know, it was bringing in some of that. And it's like, oh, I know this. Oh, I know that. Um, and it felt very real. And I just thought those characters were very real. I thought that kid looking out that window watching that football or that baseball field was very real and how that would have um, been. And, and I liked that it, I think someone in the um, description says raw, I liked that it was that way. I liked the way that it was written. I felt like I was just listening to a friend. So thank you. Thank you. Shelly, just to um, give you a, a slim, uh, slim slice of, uh, you'll, you'll see Ernie again. Oh, good. You'll see Ernie and the epilogue. What a tease. It's a tease. It's a tease. <laughs> of, of volume two, not volume one, but volume two, there, there's an epilogue and Ernie shows up in that. 
I also like the way um, you introduce a lot of Native American thought. And I really appreciated that, especially in a UP <clears throat> type book. Um, and I do think that is part of us as the white society questioning um, how we've dealt with Native American issues. So I appreciated the way that um, your book talks about them. Yeah, I, I, I'll just give a political comment. I try not to, but I will anyway. <laughs> um, when, when you think about the robber barons and the iron magnets, and I don't mean, I mean humans, the iron magnets and the lumber barons, they came to the UP, they virtually stripped it clear, took the money, build huge, huge estates, and they left the Native Americans with nothing. And what's an interesting point, although I don't pretend to be a legal scholar, is that as this money was taken, it was inherited to the next generation and to the next generation after that. This was wealth that was stolen from the Native Americans. And what's interesting is that legally, this money was passed on to subsequent generations. Never has the American, Native American, been allowed to have their property at that stage in history transferred to the next generation. It was stolen. From, from them, and and I strongly believe in reparations, and uh, it, I, I may write something about it at some point. But um, yeah, it really pisses me off, frankly. I mean, I'll, I'll get I'll get off my soapbox. <laughs> Yeah, I know what you mean, Shelly. There's a lot of different, and I like how you said, Hilton, at the beginning about, you know, as readers and writers need to help us do this to change our, our worldview. Um, I spent a lot of the years I've taught teaching overseas. And really, you know, when you see the world through different eyes, you you see a lot. So it's an eye-opening experience, especially when it comes to religion and culture. I lived a lot of my life um, overseas with Muslim people, and it, it's nothing. It's nothing like you see. <laughs> not they ain't all terrorists, are they? No, not even, not even close. <laughs> Makes you really see what how the United States is more, how we fail more than than we succeed. I would say, but um, one thing, and I don't know because I don't have my copy. Somebody checked it out, so I don't have a copy of your book here to go through but it might have been the si silent mistress i think one of the neatest parts of the whole book was when the one woman character um she had the husband that had the drinking problem is that the silent, the silent mistress, yes. okay and, and i just never saw it coming where she almost took her she tried to kill herself but then when i thought about it i'm like yeah that 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 was right i mean that's probably what she would have done you know so it was it was a very truthful book you know i, I like that about it i think it made me yeah, i mean uh, like you say and that's what good books do that's right it, it's funny you mentioned that it, it, just an aside but i'm restoring an old sailboat from 1976 and the name of the sailboat is the silent mistress oh nice and i'm going to be sailing in lake superior and writing at the same time that wherever i have a pen and a pad of paper i can write so the silent mistress yes it, it affected me deeply when i wrote it because i knew on a lot of levels that it was truth mm -hmm. now, it, it got some negative comments um which i won't pass on um it is kind of an anti-catholicism uh, story 
and that offended some people and I heard about it. But it, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't write just because you have a hostile um, response from, from certain people or groups that all that does to me is yeah, reinforce that I'm on the right road. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. So I, I, um, I don't know if there's any more questions. I have no idea how long this is supposed to take, but. Oh, we, we usually, we're usually around an hour. So, but we're a small group today. Anybody else have any questions or comments? I just have one more comment because I'm I'm stuck on the silent mistress thing. <laughs> it's interesting to me, and I I was raised Catholic. Um, I'm a recovering Catholic. Um, it's interesting to me that the honor of the people, like her husband and her, and it comes down to that darn gold tooth. That you know he goes and he gets a ring. And he trades his tooth, which is still in his mouth. But the last thing he says or, you know, information for her is that you have to take this gold tooth and give it to this person um, because that's his honor. And, and yet, you know, he's also, you know, he poaches and stuff like this. So it's like you see this person who is just so human that but he has this honor about him. Um, you know, he might drink. She questions whether he's, you know, carousing. He's not. Um, and and I just I, I loved that story. It to me it was just this is this is how people can be. Like it was just very real. And the fact that, you know, they're poor, they just don't have a lot. Um, and he wouldn't be on the government dole. <laughs> he just says, you know, no to that. He, it's like he has more integrity. Um, than a heck of a lot of people in today's world. Um, yeah. And yet, you know, he wasn't a wonderful, great person, except he was. So that's, that's I don't know, it's something about that story that really hit me. I, I like to paint my characters with frailties because I think that's how humans are. The, the, the people who put themselves on a pedestal or somebody they know on a pedestal aren't really examining that person very well. And I tried to in all of my, or most of my stories, or maybe all of them, there are human frailties because that's the way humans are built. You know, none of us are perfect and uh, thank goodness for that. Uh, it gives the rest of us failures, something to work towards, but <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Shelley. One last question. I, what is your I'd like to make one quick comment. Oh, go ahead. Uh, if, if I may. Uh, in the beginning, Hilton, you said that there really is no nor there is no Nelson. But there is. Every town in the UP is a little bit Nelson. Yes, that's every true. town in the UP has characters like those. So it, it's it it's a place that is typical of all places. And I really appreciated that about the book. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, but when I wrote the book, it was also in my mind that, you know, we're we're in an isolated area and, and it 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 informs how humans become. But this isolated geographic area is just as transferable and you'll find in volume two that there's a story about North Dakota or South Dakota, I can't remember which one, but they're both about the same. But geographically speaking, this novel is not locked just in the Upper Peninsula. My hope was to be able to translate the culture of the UP and show how it's also reflective in other rural areas of the country, whether it's Appalachia or South Dakota or North Dakota or any place that's rural and isolated. And um, we have our own peculiarities up here, but um, the, you, you'd find the same thing in other geographical areas as well. Oh, I agree. 
So which is harder to write the short story or the novel or what did you enjoy more short stories yeah without I, a doubt mm -hmm. because i can i can polish i well i i sent one into the up reader or tina did actually um last week for for the next up reader but i i get charged out of taking an idea and fleshing it out and being done with it because i have other ideas in my head you know it's like a i don't know just <laughs> just happens mm -hmm. i love short stories i think you know all those years teaching i i used to have a short story club and we would because kids like they i like the idea of being in a book club but you know they can't do that and be in school it's kind of hard but they can be in a short story club so i would find all these good short stories and i have quite a good collection from around the world and it was always fun and i think you know to be a good short story writer you really have to be a genius because you you got to say a lot and a little and it's it's fun you do a good job with it you really do thank you thank mm -hmm. you i i look forward to Having everybody read volume two, I think it's I think it's as good, and but I'm I'm a little prejudiced, but <laughs> I think it's as good. And there'll be um, towards some of the stories will be um, raw and challenging for some people to read. So. All right. Well, Hilton, I will be sending you an email asking you for your physical address because you do get a little check tonight for meeting with us. Um, and that's provided by uh, both Yupa and the Crystal Falls District Community Library. And um, thank you very much. And thanks to everybody. I hope you have a great time at the conference this weekend, those of you who are going. And nice to meet you, Tina. Tina, thank you for helping you. I think you might be a great right-hand woman because, you know, it's a good book. I can't wait for the next Well, just wait till you see volume two, okay? okay. <laughs> All right. It'll be out soon. We're hoping in July. Good. And then we are taking the month of July off for our UP Notable Book Club. And we're going to come back in August. And this book is checked out too, but we are reading The Dissecting Anatomy of a Murder. I don't know if you can see the oh. cover. So that's going to be our August book. Okay, okay. cool. Okay. I like that. Yeah. And I, Tina, I'll add you onto our, our list now. So you'll know um, all about what we're doing and, and you'll get the recordings and stuff too. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much. Thanks for everybody for putting up with me for an hour or so. You've been watching the UP Notable Books Club brought to you by the Upper Peninsula Publisher and Authors Association. To join or for more information, please visit us at www.upa.org or www.upnotable.com.